Venus in running shorts. The shutters snapped, capturing the woman's red hair as it bounced with sunlight. Inside the Nissan Stanza, Gavin followed her with the lens as she passed from the sunny parking lot and into the mall's shadow. He couldn't check the photo. The camera used film, but he was satisfied. It had been a successful afternoon. Hot afternoons always were. He kept the stanza's windows down and the air on, though it did a little to alleviate the sun's tyranny. In the passenger seat, Melvin lit a parliament and took a long drag. Gavin's forehead beaded with sweat, while Melvin kept cool and dry, despite the charcoal suit and tight red tie. Through Melvin's eyes, Gavin surveyed the parking lot. Melvin gestured with his chin. There's one. As he spoke, the cigarette bounced between his lips. The woman's dark hair flailed over her bright sundress. He caught a glimpse of creamy white flesh as the dress fluttered about her calves. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. In the rearview mirror, Gavin glimpsed a young couple walking arm in arm. They talked about an action movie, but that was just surface. Gavin only had to watch to see deeper. The man's narrow shoulders, lean arms, and patchy beard contrasted with her height, just a little taller than him. Her slender throat slid gracefully into strong collarbones that opened into bold shoulders. Gavin calculated. The man was jealous and insecure. The woman was patient and tactical. Gavin turned and snapped a hasty picture. Melvin shook his head. You're not going to use it. Waste of film. Gavin conceded the point, but he wanted to remember them. Gavin wanted to remember everyone he watched. They sat in the car for a little while longer. Gavin only packed the camera away once he had used all the film. Melvin flicked a spent cigarette through the window and clicked on his seatbelt. They pulled out of their spaces, nestled deep in the lot, hidden by the other cars, and left. The attendant at the gym had big hands, thick forearms, and long hair. His deep-set eyes peered piggishly from his square head, and his wide mouth had pale, thin lips like a fading scar. Gavin calculated that he was vain, competitive, and unhappy. Neither he nor Gavin acknowledged each other as he entered. Melvin walked beside Gavin with a big plastic fishbowl under his arm, filled with a rainbow of jelly beans. He shoved his hand into the bowl, then arched his head back to drop the jelly beans bit by bit into his mouth. In the locker room, Gavin changed clothes. Melvin adjusted his tie, shot his cuffs, and then leaned against the lockers while pawing through jelly beans. Nobody seemed to notice. Gavin always came to the treadmill after taking photos. Running released some of the subsequent pressure that strained against his chest like an overfilled balloon. On the treadmill, he could lose himself in the beat of his sneakers, focus on his body, and purge the feelings through sweat. Even here, though, he could not resist watching through Melvin's eyes. On the treadmill ahead of him was a woman with wide, round ears. Her ponytail flailed across her back like a cat of nine. The convex curve of her calves and the sharp, protruding bone of her ankles suggested motivation and loneliness. She probably had a therapist and drank too much. In the far corner beside the mirror wall, a man edging into his forties curled dumbbells to his chest. 
His muscles flexed beneath a thin sheath of fat. The high forehead and weak chin, when considered with the large knuckles and worm-like veins streaking across his forearms, implied a cruel, overstated intelligence. He thought highly of himself, but beneath alternating layers of doubt and peacock feathers, he knew it was a lie. On one of the stationary bikes sat an overweight woman with round cheeks and powerful legs. Gavin almost always saw her here. She was sad and in love, sure of herself in most ways, but unsure of herself in the ways that mattered to her the most. She was successful, but unsatisfied. She liked the stationary bike because she was lost. Gavin started watching in college, initially as a way to pass the hour between his data science and Python classes. He'd sit on one of the wooden benches next to the big pond with a pack of saltines he tossed to the ducks, surrounded by people he couldn't help but watch. After a while, he stopped merely watching and started listening, too. Soon, Gavin developed an incomplete algorithm. Long fingers indicated cleverness. Square chins suggested confidence. Pronounced knees were a sign of bitterness. Narrow shoulders implied insecurity. He wasn't always right. But he was right most of the time. As watching transformed from hobby into habit, he honed his formula. Now... Ten years later, it was as sharp as butcher's blades. Whether the behavior followed the forms, or the forms followed the behaviors, Gavin didn't know. Causality was an unimportant detail. Melvin was in mid-rant about modern sitcoms when the woman approached the treadmill. He was just as surprised as Gavin when she spoke. Hey, pervert. She crossed her arms over her chest. Gavin had to grab onto the treadmill bars to keep himself from falling. He slammed the emergency stop button and gaped. Melvin nearly choked on a mouthful of jelly beans, but he coughed them out onto the ugly gray carpet. Oh, Christ, what what kind of person sneaks up on a guy like that? He jabbed Gavin in the ribs. Say something, dumb shit. That glare's gonna burn holes in my suit. Gavin managed to stammer. Hello? Melvin slapped his forehead with the palm of his hand. Gavin tried his best to smile, but the woman recoiled. What's your damage? What do you think you're doing? Through a mouthful of jelly beans, Melvin hissed. Ask what it is to her. Ask her why she cares. I'm I'm running, Gavin replied. His legs quaked. The woman rolled her bright gray eyes and her asymmetrical bob lashed out as she shook her head. Right. That's right, you're running. Don't think I didn't see you ogling all the girls here. She spoke louder than necessary. People stared. Gavin squirmed. More than the confrontation, that was the worst. Being seen. Melvin swallowed a lump of candy and smacked Gavin's head. What are you doing? It's none of her business. Give her the finger and tell her to sit on it. The woman pressed. What? No, no macho bullshit quip? Nah, babe, I just appreciate fine art, yo. Nothing, nothing like that. Gavin thought his eyes would burst out of his skull. Jaw clenched, his nostrils flared as his breath pumped hard and fast. She glared at him a little longer and then waved him away. Whatever, just don't look at me. Gavin nodded like a jackhammer. Oh, oh, okay. Melvin threw the fishbowl skyward and kept his hands high above his head. As bright jelly beans rained down on the oblivious bystanders, bouncing off of heads and crunching beneath sneakers, he snarled, Why the fuck do I even try? Shaking his head, he produced another pack of parliaments and slapped the top against the underside of his wrist. The woman 
walked away, pulling the bottom of her sweat-soaked tank top over the back of her red running shorts. She mounted a stationary bike and shot Gavin one last glare before pumping the pedals. He turned to Melvin, but the gaunt man moved his thumb and forefinger across his lips. Nuh-uh. Mm-mm. No. Zip it. I got nothing to say to you. Gavin stared at his shoes for a little while, waiting for his legs to return to normal. When they wouldn't, he got off the treadmill and went to the locker room. Melvin walked behind him, his head and shoulders hunched, smoke trailing in his wake. Twilight had already descended when Gavin stepped outside. The orange-yellow light of tall street lamps reflected off the bodies of parked cars. Melvin rushed ahead, the cigarette still clamped between his lips, and made a straight, quick line to the Sentra. Gavin took long strides in an attempt to catch up with him. Wait, Melvin! Melvin! Melvin, what did I do? The man in the charcoal suit didn't respond. He waited by the car, his back straight and his arms crossed. A finger of ash, grown too heavy, fell off his cigarette. Gavin caught up with him, but before he could speak, Melvin whirled around and jabbed a finger into his chest. Spineless. Spineless, miserable worm with dog shit for brains. Gavin's face went flat, and he dropped his gaze to his shoes. They were traced with an exciting design cast in red plastic, and he thought they looked good on him. Melvin shook his head while he reached into his suit jacket. He spoke as he unscrewed the cap from an old dented flask. You're a dormouse doormat, letting everyone walk on you all the time. Pathetic, embarrassing, every time, all the time, a weak, spineless worm. He put the mouth of the flask against his lips and threw his head back. His Adam's apple bobbed up and down. He gasped and wiped his mouth, then pointed at the car. Open the door. Gavin thought the red plastic design on his sneakers looked sort of like an abstract version of a Chinese dragon. Melvin, hands in his pockets, leaned down and put his face between Gavin's eyes and the ground. His cigarette made Gavin squint and cough. In case I need to repeat myself, I told you to open the door. Gavin wanted to say no. He wanted to push Melvin away and tell him that he could walk home. But he knew it was meaningless. Melvin was right. He was a worm. A doormat. A weakling. Gavin would go back to his apartment, open the door, and find Melvin there, sitting as easily and calmly as if he had never left smoking a cigarette and leafing through a playboy. Melvin offered him a small, paternal smile and put a hand on Gavin's cheek. Open the door, Gav. I know what you're thinking, and you'd better quit it. You know you can't do it. You know you can't get along without me. I'm the only one in the whole world who loves you. You know that, right, Gav? Melvin patted Gavin a little too hard on the cheek, and he locked eyes with him. Ash flaked off the end of his cigarette, and he repeated, You know that, right, Gav? Gavin clenched his jaw and unlocked the door. Melvin rewarded him with a bright, charming smile and then nodded as he ducked down into the car. He closed the door, rolled down the window to let his arm hang out, and looked straight ahead. Gavin walked around to the other side, got in, and was about to turn it on when Melvin put a hand on his arm. 
without speaking, without looking at Gavin, he pointed at the gym. She was walking out. Safe inside his car, Gavin admired the woman from the gym. In the wan light of the lamps, her skin took on a milky glow. She clutched her keys as if she were ready to use them as a weapon, and her thick, powerful legs stomped against the pavement. Every step, a challenge issued to the world. Chin held high, she made her way to an old purple truck, and when she arrived, she slipped inside without a single wasted motion. Gavin reached for the camera bag, but Melvin stopped him. You can't get her. She's leaving. Time to make a choice. The seconds stretched, each into its own little infinity, and Gavin thought he wanted to go, but something, perhaps a shred of decency or... More likely, his yellow streak kept him frozen. Maybe if he waited, maybe if he hesitated, he could, he could wait for her in the car some other time. And, safe from reprimand, he could capture her in the camera. But Melvin shook his head. You've never seen her here before. Who knows if you ever will again? Her taillights flashed white, and Gavin made a choice. He turned on the car, put it in reverse, and followed her. As she turned onto the freeway, Gavin kept a few cars back like he'd seen in the movies. Melvin was asleep in the passenger seat, and a little line of drool formed at the corner of his mouth. Gavin's mind still raced. He wondered what kind of woman she was, what she liked and disliked. He'd been too petrified at the gym to look at much else other than her eyes. But from what he'd seen of her in the parking lot, he had some ideas. She was heavier than most of the women he watched, but she carried it well. As far as she was concerned, Gavin thought, she was some kind of goddess. She was bold and thoughtful, but unafraid to fight. His thoughts swam in her, in the kinds of words he imagined she'd say, in the cats he was sure she had, and in the books he was certain that she read. He swam in her and thought of everything she had and was. After getting off the freeway, Gavin didn't follow her far before she turned into an apartment complex. It was made of many buildings and stood taller than any of the complexes he'd seen in the city. It reminded him of a prison. She pulled into a space towards the middle of the lot and Gavin snuck in three rows away from her, close to the entrance. He took out his camera, screwed on the lens, and when she opened the door to her truck, Gavin captured her. Even without looking at them, Gavin knew the pictures were not very good. The angle wasn't right, and she was either too far away or obfuscated by other cars. Gavin shifted in his seat. He was unsettled. His habits drew him to the camera to see through the lens, but the situation merited attention through some other vessel. As usual, Melvin provided the solution. He pushed the camera into Gavin's lap with his hand. Put it down. Just watch. So Gavin watched. She moved the same way she had at the gym, pounding the asphalt with bitter steps, arms tense, hands clenched and clutching her keys, her whole body coiled and ready to strike. She leapt up the big, suspended concrete steps, taking them two at a time, up two, three, four floors, and stopping at a door that faced Gavin in the parking lot. Her body relaxed when she was through the door and inside. Gavin could see her through the big picture window. She disappeared into another room for a bit, and Gavin waited now using the camera like a telescope to peer into her apartment. She 
she did have a cat, a big fluffy Siamese, and a stack of fat hardcover textbooks stood beside another neat stack of papers. A spiral notebook lay open and the angle wasn't right and Gavin couldn't see what was inside. To the left of the shiny metal sink, there was a wine bottle with a cork protruding out of its mouth. The place was clean, like houses in movies. When she emerged again, it was with a purple towel wrapped around her body. Her short black hair hung in wet, clumped ropes. Her shoulders were beautiful. A congregation of fireflies glowed beneath her skin. She reached one of her small, plump hands out to take a mug off the hanging rack above the sink and wrench the cork out of the wine bottle's neck. Then, lifting the bottle, she poured some wine into the mug. Gavin zoomed in and captured her. One of her heels was elevated, tightening her calf, and the light of the kitchen cast perfect shadows that defined the curves of her back. Her hands and arms were angled perfectly. The picture would be beautiful. Gavin brought the camera down to his lap and released a happy smile. She disappeared again, taking the mug with her. Melvin sniffed dismissively and twisted around to toss a bag of popcorn into the microwave sitting in the back seat. The tiny screeches that the big, dirty thing made when he pressed buttons shattered the stillness in the Sentra and grated against Gavin's ears. Gavin turned to Melvin with a start and shot him a purple leer. Melvin met his gaze with disinterested eyes and shrugged his shoulders. What? His cigarette hung lamely from the corner of his mouth as if it had fallen asleep. You've been quiet? Gavin said. Melvin looked away and shrugged again. What do you think? Melvin's face was cast in deliberate boredom. About what? Gavin pointed at the window. About her. Melvin followed his finger and squinted his eyes. He frowned and shrugged. Gavin waited. The microwave hummed in a flat baritone on and on and Melvin flicked his cigarette out the window. He drummed his fingers against the door of the car, almost indistinguishable from the snapping of the popcorn. The microwave finished with a tremendous shriek and Melvin wasted no time twisting around to pull the hot bag out of its foul soup-stained gut. He burned his fingers on the steam, and swearing incoherently, he nursed the wounds in his mouth. Then, he wiped his hand on his pants and munched on a handful of popcorn. He made obnoxious coos of pleasure and chewed louder than he needed to. his eyes and moaned. He leaned back into the headrest and offered the bag to Gavin. Gavin sucked on his tongue. Melvin shrugged again and peered into the bag, shaking it. You gonna take any more pictures? Gavin answered with a repeat of his previous question. What do you think? Melvin dismissed the question with an incredulous look. What do you want my opinion for? You are the one who said I should come in the first place. Yeah, well, Melvin shook the bag by the bottom tab. He didn't finish his sentence. Gavin went back to his camera. She'd gotten dressed and was reading one of the textbooks at the kitchen table. She'd put on glasses and Gavin's heart stumbled in his chest. She was still drinking out of a ceramic mug. The fluffy Siamese sat at the end of the table. Gavin put pressure on the trigger, on the button of the camera. And the image was so perfect, with her hair streaming down along one side of her face, crossing her knitted brow and the black frames of her glasses. Her body held simply 
but beautifully in the fabric of pajamas. Melvin balled up the empty popcorn bag. The paper may as well have been steel, so loud was its crunching. The sound, after such relative silence, startled Gavin so much that he jumped, unsettling the camera. He missed the shot. His finger still pulled the trigger and his thumb knocked the auto flash button. The bulb above the big lens snapped lightning. The bowels of the Sentra illuminated by harsh light, Gavin cried out and Melvin tossed the crumpled bag out the window. Gavin didn't need the long lens to see her look up from her textbook. He could almost feel her tension could imagine her eyes narrow the way they did at the gym, scrutinizing the world the way people do when they know they are dreaming. In his chest, his heart ran its own treadmill, beating faster than he could stand. Why, why did he pick this place to park? He was much too exposed here. Gavin was always so cautious, yet here he was practically in plain sight. What was he thinking? Anyone who was walking the stairs could see him. They would see him with the camera. They would see Melvin. They would see him. He didn't waste another second. Gavin turned the car on, slammed the transmission out of park, and drove away. There was a stoplight at the mouth before the freeway on ramp. An old haggard beggar stood there holding a cardboard sign. Homeless, it read. Anything will help. Gavin's eyes drifted from the words up the man's crumpled, dirty shirt to the gray tangles of his beard and met his gaze. His chest tightened and his throat closed. The hairs on his arm and neck pricked to attention. He slammed his foot on the gas. A car merging off the freeway swore to avoid a collision, and Gavin pressed the gas even harder. He had been seen. Melvin laughed. Melvin laughed the whole way. Gavin rushed across the Spartan apartment to the windows and closed them, dropping the blinds over them like lids over eyes before snapping the curtains across them like blindfolds. Melvin was already on the couch, wearing only underwear and a white tank top, and was tying his arm off with a rubber tube. He ignored Gavin as he smacked his arm looking for a vein. A fresh cigarette protruded from his lips. The air was suffocating. Gavin cranked up the AC and stood under a vent, but he was still melting. His guts were melting. He rubbed his face with both hands and groaned. They didn't help. It didn't help. He didn't know what to do. He didn't understand what he felt. It was, it was like panic, but deeper, emerging as if it had been slumbering inside of him for all time, uncoiling now to hunt for something upon which it could feed. Gavin thought about treadmills, but night had long descended and the gyms were now closed. He dropped to the ground and did push-ups. One, two, three, four, five. Melvin took the antique needle all metal and glass out of his mouth and pushed out the air with a plunger. Then he used it to suck up the dope pooled in the silver spoon. The heroin washed over his face as he leaned back and went limp. Miraculously, the cigarette stayed between his lips. A clump of hot ash fell onto his chest and burned a hole in his shirt. Gavin did push-ups until his arms burned. He lay face down on the brown carpet and studied all the fibers. They twisted together into little braids, and Gavin wondered how it was made. An hour later, 
he'd calmed down enough to rise from the floor. Melvin was still on the couch. He could have been dead. Gavin felt a surge of fury as he looked at him, but pushed it back down. It was nothing doing, he knew, so rather than stew in his fury, he took his camera bag into the study. The spare bedroom had been converted into a dark room. Throughout the bare apartment, there were no indicators of the occupant between them, but somewhat ironically, the long sheets of black butcher paper that covered these walls spoke volumes about Gavin and the effort he put into watching. Heavy blackout curtains hung like lichen over the windows, and if the red bulb was off, not a single glimmer of light could be seen. It was Gavin's favorite room. He spent most of his free time here developing his work. Now, recovering from his panic, it was all he could think to do. Even in this blackened sanctuary, the feeling that had started in the parking lot was powerful, engulfing him like hot tar. Work would remove it, or at least distract from it. The dim red light soothed him. By the time he pulled his first dripping photo out of the solution, Gavin's heart beat at the rhythm of lazy waves rolling against the shore. He clipped the picture onto a line strung above the workbench and admired it with a tiny smile. On the line hung the woman with the red hair. Having her posted here, static like a bug caught in amber, she appeared to Gavin more real than she'd been at the mall. He could take his time to see everything about her. He could study her. He could, he could see her. She had lovely legs. The calves curved outward, strong and bold like a Mongol bow. They narrowed at her ankles, seamlessly bending the other way to form her heel. She was in mid-step, and Gavin could see the sole of her foot pushed up from the rubber of her flip-flop. He divined things about her from the lines that crossed her soul, interpreting her hopes, dreams, loves, and fears like a shaman reading ferret guts. She'd had a charmed life. She glowed with the light of a successful, loving childhood. The couple, taken on their own, were a handsome pair, but it was all surface. The young man had curly hair, the sparse collections of facial hair that sprouted about his cheeks and jaw looked awful, but he kept growing it anyway. Gavin read the logographic scrawl that crossed his brow. And looking at the man frozen for observation, he cringed. There were so many bad parts. Gavin felt sorry for the woman. The pity only lasted until Gavin looked at her. The woman spent too much time on her hair. Her, her makeup, what he could see of it from the angle which she stood, was done meticulously. Peeking from a curl of shiny black hair, the eye that he could see was bright but empty, like a dried well. Maybe the man was responsible for hollowing her out, or maybe she'd always been that way. Either way, their parts didn't fit together. They may as well have been creatures of opposite species. Given enough time, they would grind each other slowly into dust, each the other's millstone. The man would want too much. The woman would give too little. Gavin never understood why people so totally dissimilar ever thought they could be together. At last, Gavin looked at the woman from the gym. The pictures were incomplete. Unlike capturing people from the mall parking lot, the photos here were from much, much farther away. The pieces were smaller, 
They were more difficult to interpret, but the more Gavin looked, the less certain he was that it was the distance which made her more enigmatic. Her pieces didn't go together as Gavin was used to seeing the shape of her arms and her legs, the distance between her eyes, the, the slope of her nose. They all broadcasted conflicting properties. In her chin, Gavin saw cruelty, but in her hands, he saw kindness. In her posture, intense, hunched, there was a seriousness, but the toes of her slender feet were indicative of a certain light-hearted goofiness. Gavin didn't understand. He thought about her at the gym, picturing her as she had been then, as best as he could, freezing her in certain postures. It didn't align with what he saw here. She might have been a different woman entirely. Gavin couldn't understand. Light poured into the dark room and Gavin panicked for a moment. He whirled around to face it and leaning his forehead against the frame, there stood Melvin. Skin pale, eyes rimmed with darkness like he hadn't slept in his whole life. Sweat beating his sunken cheeks. He looked terrible. I, I need a beer. The words oozed out of his mouth, thick and black as tar. It was a bad trip. The beer will settle everything. Gavin rose from the stool and let Melvin wrap his arm around his shoulders. Melvin shared his weight with Gavin let Gavin carry him back to the couch. Gavin got the trash can from the kitchen, ran cool water over a washcloth, and brought them both to Melvin, who was already nursing a sweating bottle of Corona. Gavin knelt by him and stroked his cheek. The man was shivering in his charcoal suit. After putting a blanket over him, Gavin asked Melvin if there was anything else he needed. He received no response. Melvin was already asleep. Gavin took the beer out of his hand and poured it down the drain. The urine yellow liquid foamed as it collided with the metal basin and twisted into a little whirlpool. It was quickly gone, gurgling only briefly in the sink's throat before vanishing completely. In the car, Melvin tapped a snuff bottle over a little square mirror, then lined up the cocaine with a razor blade. None of his symptoms from the previous night were evident. He was back to his old self, rolling a dollar bill into a tube. Melvin brought the bill to the line, brought his nose to the bill, and snorted it expertly. He shuddered, shook his head, and then sniffed obsessively. Ah, uh, oh Christ, I hate the taste of drip. He paused, eyeing Gavin sidelong. Gavin wasn't paying attention. All of his energy was focused through the camera lens, moving his enhanced gaze from person to person, hesitating only momentarily to confirm that none of them were her. They were parked outside the gym, which Melvin said was a dumb idea. He said they should be waiting outside the apartment. But Gavin recoiled at the very notion. Things had gotten too close the night before. He didn't have proof, but Gavin was certain she'd at least seen something, even if she hadn't seen him. The way the parking lot there was organized left no good places to either see or to hide, and Gavin needed both. He felt too vulnerable at the apartment. Melvin jabbed him in the ribs. I said, I hate the taste of drip. Gavin shot him an annoyed glare, then returned to his camera. Why do you do it then? He wasn't really paying attention to what he said. He gave Melvin the setup he wanted. Melvin grinned and spread his hands wide. With jazz hands and enthusiasm, he said, Because I love cocaine! His whole body shook as if he were having a cartoon spasm, and he repeated the statement louder, pushing his hands against the roof of the Sentra. Oh, 
I love cocaine. Gavin scanned the parking lot again. She wasn't there. He passed over specimen after specimen and could not find her. Melvin started singing Dark Eyes in the original Russian. Gavin didn't understand the words, but he knew the song. Melvin always sang it when he was high on cocaine. The car rocked when Melvin started dancing in his seat, and the bouncing unsettled Gavin's view. He hated when Melvin did cocaine, though his good mood was contagious. When his song finished, Melvin opened the door and climbed to the roof of the car. He danced to soundless music and made the car bounce up and down even more. If she appeared, Gavin wouldn't be able to get a good shot. He almost tossed the camera to the empty passenger seat, but thought better of it and said, put it down gently. He got out of the Sentra, slammed the door, and glared at Melvin. Get down. I'm on top of the world, Melvin shouted, jumping once and striking a dramatic pose as he landed. Get it, Gav? Get it? I'm on top of the world! Gavin did not get it. You're embarrassing me. Melvin laughed. <laughs> I'm embarrassing you? <laughs> That's rich like chocolate pretzels. Get down. People are staring. Melvin's face spread with another grin, and he cocked his eyebrow. Are they staring at me, though, I wonder? It was a taunt. He threw it out in some form or another whenever he was flying with Coke as his co-pilot. Gavin always blamed it on the Coke. Please, get down. Melvin gave him the finger, then resumed dancing. A car pulled into the open space behind Gavin, but he was too focused on Melvin to notice. It wasn't until she spoke through the open window that he turned to look. Hey, weirdo. Gavin jumped and his cheeks ignited. He spun around and saw the girl he'd been waiting for. Her hair was held out of her face with white clips shaped like bows. The corners of her mouth twitched with the curlicue of a wicked grin, and her eyes gleamed like a cat's watching a cornered mouse. The Sentra's shocks groaned when Melvin sat down. The heels of his polished brown wingtips clacked against the glass of the driver's side window. He rumbled a low, harsh chuckle and pulled a cigarette out of the dark blue pack with his teeth. He lit it inhaled and then arched his head back to swipe a plume of smoke across the fading blue of the sky above. He didn't offer any help to Gavin, but he did lean over to flick cigarette ash over his head. The woman sighed and arched an eyebrow. You ever been told you suck at talking? Gavin couldn't help but give her a bashful grin. Yeah, I've heard that before. She waited the corners of her mouth still twitching under the shadow of an expectant, practiced smile. With the open truck window framing her, the light of the dying day painted her face with sharp, dark oranges reflected off of her hair almost as purple. Her eyes were still gray and bright and full of bottled mercury motion. She did not wait forever. The crouched smile waiting for an opportunity to spring across her face lingered lamely in form alone. The light, the purpose behind that smile was gone now that the woman realized that she and Gavin were not playing the same game. She looked away, wringing the steering wheel like a chicken's neck. She briefly returned a shy, disappointed gaze to Gavin but it grew too heavy, and she dropped it into her lap. The seatbelt clicked and then riffled, and the old truck groaned as she slipped out. Gavin watched her walk away, following her by the red running shorts until she disappeared into the gym. Nausea blossomed in his throat like a carrion flower. The lines of everything in the world broke apart and scattered into indistinct spaces of color. 
Gavin stretched out a hand to press against the car, afraid he might fall and the metal of the Sentra was neither warm nor cool. Melvin flicked the cigarette butt at Gavin. The ember bounced off his forehead, and as Gavin slapped a hand to the miniature burn, Melvin sent his glinting wingtip straight to Gavin's jaw. He spun a half-turn and then collapsed onto his hands and knees. Melvin slipped off the roof of the car. His charcoal suit jacket was gone, and he was loosening his tie, rolling up the sleeves of his starched white shirt. Gavin rolled to face him. The sun hung behind Melvin's head, eclipsing him in darkness and tracing his head in a halo. As he lowered his face to light another cigarette, the sun blinded Gavin. The cigarette stuck out of Melvin's mouth like a fist in a boxer's stance, ducking and weaving as he spoke. Nobody's staring now. I wonder what that means. Melvin sucked on the cigarette, and the ember burned so bright that Gavin had to shield his eyes. Smoke poured out of his nostrils in thick rolls like a heavy fog, and Melvin's pale blue eyes crackled with lightning from the bottled storm within. Gavin faded. The world went black. Thank you for sharing my nightmares and helping me carry the grief. I hope you enjoyed part one of my novella, Venus in Running Shorts. Be sure to tune in next week for part two. If you can't wait until the next episode, you can find Venus in Running Shorts on Amazon. You can also download a copy as part of membership on my Patreon. I've included links for both below. If you enjoy the show, Share your favorite nightmare with a friend or family member. Don't forget to leave a rating and remember to subscribe and turn on notifications. I'd love to connect with you on Instagram, Facebook, or threads. Just look for Nightmares and Grief and you'll find me. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Good night.